tonight, the Center for Marxist Studies and Students for Libertarian Society will present a forum on freedom, libertarian versus Marxist perspectives. Our speakers, where am I there? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> professor Bertel Ullman, Associate Professor of Politics at NYU, and author of Alienation and Social and Sexual Revolution, and a celebrated creator of the game Class Struggle. And Don Lavoy, right. economics instructor at Rutgers University. He is editor of the Austrian Economics Newsletter. His articles have appeared in the Journal of Libertarian Studies and in Libertarian Review. And he is presently working on his PhD at NYU with Professors Kersner and Becker on the calculation debate. And as for our debate, each speaker will give a short presentation of his perspective, and then there'll be two questions. It will have time for two cross questions, and we'll open it up to audience participation. I should just remind you that we're going to be hearing from two very different strains of radical thought, and we should keep in mind that the meaning of the word radical is fundamental. And who is going to go first? <laughs> I don't care one way or the other. You want to flip? All right. Okay. The objective is flip. First coin. We're going for money or rent? Using state money. State money. <laughs> <laughs> Heads or tails? Heads. Hey. Okay. So uh, I get to go first. Um, I had actually anticipated that I'd be confronting a, a mass of Marxists and the trickle of libertarians into the door. And it turns out it's about the other way around. Most of the faces I recognize as uh, libertarian activists, and there aren't that many Marxists. But uh, nonetheless, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is is going to act as if uh, at least Marxism is relevant to the discussion um, and, and try to show some of the contrasts and similarities between the two radical approaches around the idea of freedom. What, there are some similarities, believe it or not, in their ideas of freedom, although there are certainly some important differences which will come out. Um, I think to start out, just to clear the field of a few common confusions that crop up in this kind of discussion about a word like freedom, which is used by everybody and it sort of means everything good to everybody. Um, one of the first things we should do is try to distinguish between positive and negative conceptions of freedom. And whether that's really that important, or, w or whether you're talking about a positive or a negative conception. Um, it's all, Libertarians are usually accused in this context of uh, proffering only a negative concept of freedom, that is, we want to be free from coercion by the state, free from being enslaved, free from taxes, and so on. Um, but we don't, at least not that often, discuss what positive virtues there are in the concept of freedom. Um, I, would, I would argue that really both libertarians and Marxists can phrase their conception of freedom in either positive or negative terms and that it's really not a fundamental, that's not the fundamental distinction whether we're talking about positive or negative. Each of us can discuss the virtues of our conception of freedom. Um, each of us can, uh, dis can define our kind of freedom in terms of what things are lacking from the world we imagine to be a free world, just as much as describing it by what things are in such a world. Um, related to these ideas of positive and negative freedoms is the question of freedom as opposed to wealth. Um, another accusation libertarians have to face often is that um, since we're only arguing what th that we should be free from all of these specific kinds of coercion that we're against, um, that doesn't make our free world a, a very much of a utopia because certainly there are going to be some people, for example, who have much less wealth than others. Um, and no matter how free you are, you can be free to buy caviar or free to, to fly to London, but not everyone happens to have the resources available to do those sort of things. So you're not actually in practice able to do all those things. Um, by the libertarian conception of a free society, that doesn't imply that everyone is able to do all things or that we're able to do things equally, that one person is able to do all the things that another person wants to do and so on. 
that that's not what we're talking about. All we're talking about is is liberty that in the sense of free from coercion by a fellow man. And that does leave us with a world which there will still be hardships in. There'll be still people who don't have enough food. And there'll be there'll have to be ways to deal with that. There'll have to be like generous people who, who give the people the food and so on. Now I would argue that a consequence of a free society would be the generation of more production and the alleviation of a lot of the scarcities that, that cause people to suffer under present society and under all previous societies. So I would say that liberty is a way of alleviating the lack of wealth in a society. In fact, that it's the best way historically. Um, in fact, I could even uh, quote Marx in that context that uh, capitalism historically has been the most productive system and although Marx wasn't around to see the flourishing of the 20th century systems, um, I think one can still maintain that to the extent that a society is capitalist is uh, re very closely related to the extent to which it's able to produce mass quantities of goods, and uh, so liberty is a means of increasing wealth in society. So there's a connection there, but what we're talking about when we say people should be free is not that they should be able to do all things, but only that they should be, in a specific way, free from different sorts of coercion from, uh, from, <clears throat> from other people. Excuse me. Now, what do we mean by what sorts of coercions? What is, what is the thing that we want to prohibit, and what are the things that we want to allow? Uh, that question, generally put, is really, the I think, the fundamental issue in all social sciences. It's the question of, the boundaries between people in the sense of what we should encourage people to to do with respect to other people how our relationships with other people are to be conducted what kinds of relationships we absolutely prohibit what kinds of relationships we allow but perhaps try to persuade people to not undertake and if we are prohibiting some sorts of actions what do we do about those how do we act with respect to those people who are violating our idea of what people should do with respect to each other. So all of this is involved in this question of what you could call drawing the line, finding the line that divides the people who form a, co a cooperative society that we want to call the, the future free society on the one hand, and the people who are standing in the way of that, the, the enemy, the opposition, on the other hand. Where do you draw that line? Now there are those uh, although there aren't many in this room, but there are those, and they're probably the majority, who deny that such a line should be drawn at all, who argue that we're all cooperating, we're all harmonious in society, that there are no enemies, we should just hold hands and, and join together in, in uh, social harmony. And uh, what distinguishes a radical group like the SLS, or the, I suppose any Marxist group, is that we uh, we do believe there has to be line drawn that there are people who are, are clear-cut enemies who we have to resist um, and in some cases we have to resist violently so we believe in drawing the line and where we differ is where we draw believe we should draw the line what sorts of activities we would prohibit is a different class than the, the kinds of maybe I shouldn't use the word class is a, is a different uh, category than all the, uh, the things which the Marxists would prohibit. To understand the differences here, I would like to sort of simplify the differences, um, and we can get into detail on very specific topics of what sorts of issues uh, different people are concerned with here, but I, I would try to categorize the kinds of things that we uh, prohibit along a spectrum. I would say there's a sense in which libertarians are more permissive than Marxists. In the sense that we, when we draw the line, we're willing to allow a lot of different kinds of interrelationships among people, which a Marxist would find uh, repugnant. Among these, in this category of things which we would allow, but the Marxists would not allow, um, you could call, for example, um, speculation on the stock market, for example, or profit-making per se, the, uh, the idea that someone goes into business, uh, puts his, finds some financing, makes a, an interest rate return on that financing, that is a return that he doesn't actually labor for, but a return on the basis of the capital he put up for his project. Uh, that sort of earning 
is condemned by Marxists, but would be permitted by libertarians. Um, in fact, all sorts of uh, competitive rivalry in society are things which we would not only per, uh, permit, but in many, many of us would actually proclaim the benefits of that sort of competitive rivalry um, for society as a whole, but not necessarily for the losers in competition in any particular case, of course. So ju that that's kind of is a way of, of looking at what the differences are between the Marxist and libertarian when it comes to freedom, the kinds of things that uh, we would say people would be free even though they're, uh, they're in a society where some people are earning profits and other people are only earning wages. Whereas a Marxist would say there's an extent to which that society is not a free society. Now, th there are things that we would both condemn. Um, we would both condemn uh, most instances of thievery or murder or things like that. Uh, although there is uh, even there some differences, for example, I mean, the expropriation of the capitalist uh, property to start with, to a libertarian that looks like stealing the capitalist property, to a Marxist that looks like getting back the property that properly belongs to the worker. So there are differences there, like I'm saying, I'm kind of simplifying in order to try to uh, emphasize uh, certain points about the, where we draw boundaries, the two different kinds of radicalism. And then way on the other side, of, you know, in the middle sort of you have this group of, of uh, competitive rivalry kind of actions which we allow and Marxists condemn. On the one side we have the things which we both condemn. On the other side we have the, the kinds of activity where we can both say it's fine, where we both agree that's perfectly legitimate kind of interpersonal activity. And there you could put any kind of close cooperative activity. Uh, for example, a, a worker-managed factory would certainly be a case where we could both agree uh, there's nothing wrong with workers having their own means of production, making their own goods, and so on. Uh, there's nothing wrong with any kind of uh, commune where people all voluntarily join and, and live together and do their thing together. Um, so any kind of close cooperative, family cooperation, to the extent that it's non-coercive, is permissible by both systems, and so on. Now, what we, what the libertarian would argue is that the the, um, the Marxist ideal of abolishing this competitive kind of rivalry, the kinds of activities which uh, libertarians would permit, um, and that Marxists seek to abolish. Um, we would argue that it's simply not possible to abolish that kind of activity. That if you try to, you end up not only not going beyond the libertarian, limited libertarian perspective of achieving this kind of negative freedom, free from coercion of other people, you not only do not go beyond that, but you can't even get that far. That to the extent that you try to abolish all competition in the society and unify production under a central plan, that the end result of that uh, attempt is to revert to a, to a less progressive form of society. So what, uh, this brings up the question of what we mean by a progressive society. What is progress in society? How does society develop? Why should we call one kind of society more progressive than another? Well, Marx has a very systematic approach to this sort of thing, and, and much of his approach, I think, can be uh, readily accepted by most libertarians, although libertarians have not spent much time studying Marxism. But, for example, Marx is, at Marx's own time, he saw, again I have to simplify, but he saw a scheme of development of society broadly going from, uh, first of all, early uh, communal ancient societies where, uh, just as in uh, tribes of baboons or something, you have very primitive production taking place among people who are in close cooperation with each other, almost like a family, who per you know, perceive what things have to be done by that tribe and who allocate uh, tasks to different parts of the tribe and so on. From, from that sort of very primitive society, we can see progress toward uh, all sorts of other uh, societies, including studying which is the development of a new kind of society called capitalism, in, at first in 
a sort of mixed form mercantilism which still has many of the uh, sort of outlines of the, the earlier feudal system. It still has the, uh, the old system of privilege. It's still The state is still very much a defender of the old class. And as, few, as mercantilism itself progresses, um, typically a new class of, of merchants takes control of the state. Uh, this sort of pattern in history repeats itself in many different cases, although it doesn't, doesn't adhere rigidly in any form, but Marx wouldn't have claimed it did anyway, so that, that's not an issue. So but then as we proceed out of mercantilism toward liberalism, we achieve another stage of progress where instead of people being bound by the sort of uh, rigid privilege systems that previous forms had, had been uh, structured by, in other words, instead of uh, one person having advantages over another simply because he is of, of the nobility and so he has the power of the state at his beck and call, rather than that, power starts to adhere in the money form. Uh, people who have more wealth become more powerful rather than people who have connections with the nobility or strings to pull with the king or whatever. Now Marx considers this uh, a, a very important, significant step of progress away from the privileged systems that preceded capitalism. Uh, but of course Marx is very critical of capitalism as well as being certainly not enough. Uh, but in Marx's outline of the way things were progressing, he believed that following liberal capitalism, and in fact due to the very internal forces of liberal capitalism, there would emerge a new society, which he called socialism, um, mainly because there would be such, in liberal capitalism there are tendencies for increasing concentration, centralization of production, to the point where it becomes possible for all of society to appropriate the means of production rather than uh, have all production separately produced by individuals in capitalism. So it turns out one of Marx's main theses about socialism in contrast with capitalism is that in capitalism you have this anarchy of production. Everyone produces what he thinks he ought to produce on the basis of what he thinks he can make profits at, whereas under socialism Everyone doesn't have his own decision about what to produce. All production is coordinated under a central plan. And this is supposed to eliminate a lot of the rivalry, for one thing, the, um, the alienation that occurs under capitalism because different people are competing with each other. And it's supposed to also um, increase production. Well, we have to contrast this whole schema of development with what's actually happened. And um, most Marxists have to admit that what's happened since Marx is not quite what Marx expected to happen. Certainly we didn't get socialism right on the heels of liberal capitalism. Instead, we got a different form of capitalism, which Lenin called imperialism in the, in the West, whereas in the in the Eastern countries, in the so-called communist countries, due to Marx's own theories himself and a whole structure, a whole slew of other factors, but uh, in countries like the Soviet Union and other so communist countries, so-called, uh, we have something that modern Marxists tend to call a society in, transi in transition to socialism. That is some something new, something which. Uh, some people try to find roots in Marx's own writing for, but I, I don't think there's much much that can be made out of that. But uh, in any case, they are claiming that this society that's in the Soviet Union is in some sense a positive progressive step out of, uh, actually it didn't come out of liberal capitalism, it came out of a, a feudal system. In almost every case, it comes out of like in feudal Russia, the czarist regime is overthrown. Uh, Lenin and his Marxist uh, party, the Bolsheviks, take over and they try to institute socialism, which they call a transition to uh, full communism, a sort of intermediate system. Okay, so that's how modern Marxists perceive the development on both sides. They perceive the Western development as going from liberal capitalism 
not directly into socialism, but instead into some intermediate stage of capitalism called imperialism. And then on the other side, on the, on the east side, they again insert this additional stage of transition socialism, which is different from the, total, the ultimate ideal of socialism. It's also different from the imperialism that's going on in the West. Now, is that a proper way of, of modifying Marx in the light of later history? Assuming since Marx's prediction didn't come out right, we have to modify something. We can't, we can't deny the fact that things are different, and we can't deny the fact that there is not socialism the way he depicted it in his writings a uh, hundred years ago. So we have to come up with some way of modifying Marx's ideas to cope with the changes in reality that have occurred since he wrote. Well, I would argue that uh, this isn't the way to analyze what's happened since then. That, in fact, in both the West and the East, what we have is not a further progressive step towards socialism that's occurred, but we've gone backwards in both cases. That is, we, we certainly can't, we can't take Marx and Marx's system of historical materialism to mean that whatever comes after something else is a progressive step over that. Whatever comes next can't necessarily be progress over what happened before. First of all, certainly Marx himself recognized that in his studies of older history. He recognized that this uh, pro progression and development of society is a very complex thing, and sometimes it progresses very well, sometimes it backs up, sometimes it doesn't go very far. Well, I would say, and it's, I think it's very significant in the contrast between our kinds of liberty that, we're, that we defend, I would say that even from a Marxist point of view, even analyzing according to Marxian categories, both the West and the East have not seen a step that takes us closer to socialism in the 20th century. Rather, we've seen a backwards, a retrogressive development. Now, how do I mean that? I mean that the kind of system that we have in the West is closer to mercantilism and feudalism than it is to socialism, as Marx himself depicted it. We didn't, we, when we went up to liberal capitalism, that was a step in progress above the kind of mercantilist privilege that had preceded capitalism. I believe that was a progressive step, that uh, having money be the, uh, and the market forces be the impersonal forces that dictate our lives, I believe that's a very positive step above having some king determine or some lord of, of a manor determine uh, what we do with our lives. So that is a positive step in, in the Marxian sense even, a uh, step toward further liberty. But since, since liberal capitalism has been pretty much washed out by a state capitalism, a very powerful interference in all areas of the market, uh, imperialism abroad, intensive regulation and nationalization at home, uh, abrogation of liberties across the board of all kinds in, in this country and aiding dictators around the world and abrogating the liberties of their people. All of these are developments which take us backwards, take us away from liberal capitalism, back toward mercantilist and, and uh, fuel type relations between people. Similarly, in Soviet countries, what, what exists in the Soviet Union is not some transition to a higher ideal socialism that's even better than liberal capitalism, which not only gives us the freedoms that, li that libertarians and classical liberals have always talked about, but in addition gives us all these, uh, these uh, higher freedoms. It doesn't do that at all. In fact, it backs us up. It gives us a, a, a very czarist kind of regime there, it denies basic liberties, civil liberties of all kinds. It, uh, it forms itself into an imperialist country, just like the West. Uh, it oppresses people abroad, as in the uh, revolutionaries in Afghanistan who are trying to resist their oppression there, and, all, and many other countries around the world. So what we have in, around the world is, uh, is not an attempt to go beyond the libertarian platform of of freedoms, um, but rather, if, if they did attempt that, they, what they resulted instead was to back up and to lose even those freedoms. 
So I think it's important to emphasize that the, the Marxian ideas that came out in the 19th century were built on the basis of liberal freedoms as the basis, as the at least minimum program. Marx himself was an enemy of states all over the world, and uh, his, some of his rhetoric would match some of the most eloquent libertarians in this room in, in his hatred of the form of government that had existed in all history. Um, and he, I don't think what he would wanted was another form of state oppression. I don't think what he wanted was a kind of new class to take over the Soviet Union and oppress people in very much the czarist way. But what happened was that attempts to institute Marxism, which is an attempt to not be sufficient, not be satisfied with liberal freedoms, with protecting individual rights and property, but instead sought to go beyond that, what it accomplished was to get less than that. And I think we would, uh, even from a Marxist point of view, we would be going in definite progress if at this point we could adopt the same values as the classical liberals adopted in Marx's time, and we formulated a revolution on, a, on libertarian lines to at least get us the freedoms that libertarians talk about. Whether or not it's ever even possible to go beyond the system of freedom that libertarians have advocated is a question that I don't want to have time to talk about here, um, but uh, it's something that I certainly doubt. Um, but I would say that even beyond that question, even if we admit that it's possible in some conceivable sense to, to have a communist society, to go beyond liberal capitalism, um, I believe the only way you could do that would be through liberal capitalism. So even from within the Marxist point of view, the best policy ought to be considered to be libertarianism. First let me say how pleased I am that we're having this meeting. I've had an opportunity uh, in CARD, the anti draft group on the campus to work with a number of libertarians. And I think uh, libertarians and socialists work very well together. And from recent announcements in Washington, it looks like we have a lot of work to do together on uh, the same problem in the future. Uh, so it's good to, to meet together to discuss uh, our differences, as well as what we have in common, as well as common work. So I think this is a very useful meeting. And I, I, I'm glad that uh, the tone is um, an academic tone, so we can agree to disagree and then go on talking about these matters and go on cooperating about what we do agree on uh, politically. Uh, second, uh, I'd like to say that I'm not going to talk about the Soviet Union. Uh, I've spoken a number of places about uh, socialism. About American socialism, and almost always um, people try to, especially in the discussions, talk about the Soviet Union. In fact, in one uh, talk I gave, I counted the questions, and I talked about Americans, the talk about America, socialism in America, and I think it was something like 16 of the 17 questions were about the Soviet Union. Uh, I consider this something, uh, if you'll forgive the pun, something of a red herring. Uh, I'm interested tonight in uh, other times I'd be glad to talk to you about the Soviet Union and anything else, but tonight I want to talk about freedom, and so my subject will be, and, and this is what I'll focus on, will be on freedom. The first thing to notice about freedom is that everybody is in favor of it. Is there anybody here who is against freedom? It's a rhetorical question. I don't expect anyone to say yes. Everybody's in favor of freedom, even Hitler favored freedom for the German folk. Uh, the argument is never between those who favor freedom and those who are against freedom, though sometimes certain groups tend to put it in this way, but mostly for polemical purposes. Uh, this is no way to understand what freedom is, uh, what's good about it, what needs to be done to preserve it or promote it, uh, no way to try to phrase the discussion in terms of we're for freedom and you're against freedom. Rather, what one must do, and right from the very start, is ask and try to answer four interrelated questions. These are, first, freedom, 
Freedom for whom? Whose freedom? Whose freedom are we talking about? The discussion we've just heard, and I think, in fact, most of the discussions in America talk about freedom as if we're talking about everybody's freedom, as if uh, the society is free. Societies aren't free. People are free or not free. Uh, and in any given society, there's going to be differences. And so we got to ask, first of all, whose freedom are we talking about? Second, freedom to do what? Once you recognize the differences, then you want to know something about the content of those differences. Freedom at its core has to do with being able to do something and say something, right? Well, uh, different people want to do and say different things. So uh, you want to be able to focus on what exactly these different groups who are or are not free actually want to do or say. So the second question then is, um, Freedom to do what? The third question is, with what means? Freedom at its core has to do with being able to do or say something. Uh, almost always, in all but the uh, most trivial instances of freedom, there are some conditions or means which are required by whatever group you're talking about to do or say what it is they want to do or say. So that's the third question. With what means? And then to examine whether, in fact, those means are available. And the fourth question, as important as all the others, these must be looked at, looked at as a package. The fourth question is, at whose expense? Uh, once we recognize the answer to the first question, that we're never talking about everybody's freedom, we're always talking about some group's freedom. And as we go through answers or try to give answers to the other questions, we're going to discover that what enables some people to be free reduces and may even take away the freedom of others. So freedom, as soon as we recognize we're not talking about everybody's freedom, and we can't be, then it's a cliche, a slogan, uh, as soon as we recognize we're not talking about everybody's freedom, you have to try to understand at whose expense. Now let me go through these different answers to these different questions as, a, as I think many socialists. Now, I don't claim to speak for all socialists or all Marxists. Uh, this is one Marxist speaking to you, although I, I suspect that a lot of what I say would uh, be accepted by many other socialists. Uh, I said the first question is, freedom for whom? It's always someone's freedom, and usually it includes the person speaking. So that if you favor freedom, you clearly, uh, almost always, I would expect, unless you're some kind of a masochist or not, uh, <laughs> leaving yourself out. So you, you, you're including yourself. And probably, too, uh, you're including people who are very much like you, people who are members of the kind of groups or classes uh, uh, perhaps race uh, or religion that you belong to, but certain groups are often included. It's the first thing to be clear. Second question, we recall, is uh, to do what? Freedom to do what? Well, different people want different things, and the first thing you have to uh, deal with is are these things which people want to do, uh, are they available? Do they, in fact, exist? And the answer, I think, has to be, in any society, yes for some, that is to say, some of the things that people want to do, to become, to have, uh, some of those things are available, so some people can do it. And, those, and for what other people want to do, to have, to become, for what other people want, these things won't be available. So, for example, if you want uh, any one of the 30 or 40 or 50 toothpastes on the market, uh, you can go into most American supermarkets, and these things are available. Uh, you, in other words, uh, I'll give you a whole number of things which are available, but you know them as the things, in fact, that you choose between. Uh, but if you want, as I think many socialists do, if you want to and many workers do, if you want to work in a s secure job, if you don't want to have to be worried about losing your job, 
if you want to work in a meaningful job, if you want to be able, these are the things you want to do, if you want to be able to enjoy cooperative, non-competitive relations with your fellow human beings, if you want to exercise your creativity even in areas where you can sell the product and make a quick buck, uh, if you want to participate in the democratic running of your school or your workplace or your apartment house, um, if you want to live in a comfortable and safe city, uh, these are things which uh, lots of you non-workers and non-socialists will even want to do. And these, these are things which I would suggest are not available, or at least hardly available, uh, in our society. Now there's a related problem which I can't go into now, and we can discuss it later, which is how do people come to want the things they do, because I've been assuming uh, that the question is just the availability of the things that people want. Uh, but there's also the problem of how they come to want that, which raises the whole question of socialization, which raises the whole question of advertising and propaganda. We can't assume that when you go into the supermarket that you, the essential, intrinsic you, uh, really wanted to buy Colgate toothpaste. Uh, and, and, you know, the really intrinsic you really wanted to squeeze the charm in, that that was something coming out of your human nature, and not something I'd have seen this advertisement a hundred times. So that there's a very important problem here, which has to be dealt with in talking about freedom and, the, uh, and, and trying to answer the question of what is available. There's a very important problem of why we come to want the things available. Uh, some people are satisfied with the choice that most people are going to have between Carter and Reagan for president, uh, and they'll have been socialized to be satisfied with that. This is not part of their intrinsic human nature. Others will not be satisfied. The choice that they want, uh, let's say they're not libertarians or not supporters of the Citizens Party, won't be available. So what they will need in order to be free simply won't be available. I'm talking about the political sphere and the economic sphere, and I'm also talking about the sphere of human relations, and you can tell that from my example. What is not available in our society are certain kinds of relationships, certain kinds of control, democratic control over your place of work, where you live, which is not available. Uh, and therefore, people who want that can't be free. Because part of what freedom is, is the, has to do with the availability of what it is you want. Now, the third question was, with what means? Because most of the things that you want to do or become uh, to say is a little uh, less complicated in a way, but freedom isn't only a matter of freedom of speech, it's also freedom to do and become things. Most of these things require you to go through certain means, require there to be certain conditions. The most obvious of this is money. Uh, now, there's a great inequality of wealth. I don't have to offer any statistics here. The great inequality of wealth, and the more money you have, the more of a means you have to do what you want, to buy the house you want, take the vacation you want. You're free to do these things. Money is the power. But it's not just money. It's also position. It's also being the boss or the chairman or president of some business. Uh, it's also position in certain hierarchies. It's also status which goes with that. There's various things. It's various things which you have to examine as the means, and you have to recognize that these means are not equally available to everybody. There's a very great inequality in the means which are necessary for most people to do what they want, which permits some people to do what they want, to be free, and others not. Now, the state is just one of these means. Uh, one of the things I hope to discuss a little later is what I think is the exaggerated importance that libertarians give to the state and the fact that the state is a power and does restrict many of us in doing what we want. Not all of us. For many, the state which they control helps them do what they want, doesn't restrict them, gives them a hand. So uh, then the state is certainly um, one of the elements of power I'm talking about, and it is unequally distributed. Some people have more access to it than others, uh, have more influence in it than others. It doesn't help us or restrict us all equally, but it is just one element in a system of power, because 
the state, private property, which has to do with the inequality of wealth. I don't mean by private property the toothbrush that you use at night. The private property has to do with the inequality of wealth in the society. Uh, the inequality of positions uh, of power in, in different structures, the inequality of status, these things are all part of a system of power within a society. And the same group of people who have more of one have more of all the others. So if you want to do away with any one inequality, you really want to do away with the others. You really want to topple the group, and to use a Marxist expression, the class, which has the greater amount of power, the greater amount of all these different means of power. To simply try to do away with the state while leaving all these other inequalities uh, untouched will permit the same group to be more free than anybody else, to be able to do as much more of what they want than anyone else, because all these other means, which are as necessary as the aid or restraint uh, which you find in the state, because all these other means are unequally distributed. But uh, I'd like to come back to that again, perhaps in the discussion we talk about why liberals, libertarians give this, uh, what I would consider, uh, too great emphasis to the state here, or as important as it obviously is. So that's the third question. With what means? The first question, again, is uh, whose liberty are we talking about? The second question is... Uh, to, uh, to do what? Uh, and the third question is, with what means? The fourth question is, at whose expense? For one group to be free, which includes, as we've just seen, having the means to do what it wants, is often to reduce the freedom of others. For those <laughs> who have the means, the greater wealth, the control of the factories, the greater influence in government, which permits them to do what they want. This reduces the freedom of the rest of us to do what we want, because we don't have that amount of money. We don't have much influence in the government. Uh, we don't have the positions in the various hierarchies, which are controlled by the same people. And so their ability to do what they want positively restricts our ability to do what we want. And if we are to obtain the ability to do what we want, uh, we're going to have to take away the means which they use to give them, to permit them to be free. And in their words, we're going to take away their freedom. And they have a point. We're going to have to keep capitalists from being free to use their wealth their control of their factories, their control of their workers, to live the kind of life they're now doing, to buy the kind of special privileges they buy for their children, uh, to control the course, the, the progress of the whole society. This is what they're now able to do. Their freedom that they demand is freedom to do this. And the power that they have resides in their unequal access, their greater than equal access to the things like government, money, uh, status, uh, positions uh, in, in various hierarchies. And all of this we're going to have to take away from them in order to, for the great majority of us who work for a living, and I'm here not talking just about socialists, but I'm talking about people who work for a living. I understand the worker here very broadly, blue and white collar worker. Most of us are workers uh, or will be workers. For us to do what we want, to have the means to do what we want, we're going to have to take away those means from other people and reduce their freedom. And that's clear. And a choice has to be made. A choice has to be made, quite simply, of which side are you on. And you have to begin by looking at who you are and what kind of family you come out of, uh, what kind of activity you're engaged in now, uh, and also what kind of activity you hope to be able to do when you finish uh, when, you, when you leave the university. And coming out of that, you see which group you come into, and you see that to be free as a member of that group, you need certain things, and that that requires that you take certain, uh, certain powers away from other groups which are now inhibiting the group that you recognize you belong to. So I'm saying that freedom... And this is my major conclusion, and I think it, it's terribly simple, but I think most people 
uh, most non-socialists miss it, is that freedom is an either-or idea. Freedom is for them or it's for us. Now, having said that, and if you recognize that even a little bit, the question which immediately jumps to mind is if that is so, why is it often presented and defended even by many of us, that is, by many of people who are obviously workers, uh, as I, as I uh, suggest most of you are? Why is it understood and defended by most people on my side in this way that I'm criticizing? Why do they treat freedom as an absolute? Why do they talk about it as something which applies to everybody and talk about the American society as a society where freedom exists and another society as a society where freedom doesn't exist? What I'm saying is that in each society, there's some groups which are free and some groups which aren't. But people in my society who, by nine net definition, are not free, talk about freedom in a way which doesn't make sense of their own lives. And, and now I would like to suggest why this is so. Well, first, let's be, maybe try to focus a little more clearly about what they're doing uh, and that what I take it libertarians are, are doing here, too. What is being focused on are two general qualities of freedom. One, the absence of restraint. And two, the fact of there being a choice. So that when you go into a supermarket, you're not presented with one brand. So that when you go into an election a booth, you have more than one candidate. What is being left out of the understand of what freedom is all about is um, is what is the quality of that choice? Is it the Tweedledumlekins and the Tweedledemlecrats? Uh, is it, you know, all these things in the supermarket? Uh, Europeans, by the way, I, I don't know if you've had this experience, but the uh, Europeans who come into American supermarkets, which with their terrific variety, say all these things taste alike. <laughs> and they come into these American towns, which uh, we think of, you know, that Chicago, New York, well, New York's a little special for obvious reasons, mostly because there's not too many Americans living in New York. <laughs> but <laughs> all these other towns, they travel, they do the whole tour of America, and they say, well, the geography varies a lot, but all the towns look alike, and the food tastes alike. And this terrific variety turns out to be a difference without a real difference, for the most part. And this is being left out, this fact of the, the character of the choices is being left out. What's being focused on by most people here is, are these two factors. Freedom exists where there's an absence of restraint, where there's no one actually throwing you in jail uh, or, or throwing you in the army, which of course comes to the same thing. Uh, and, where, and where there's some kind of choice, so the, 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 the character of the choice is not examined. Now, what does this do? Uh, what this does, practically, is that all people are being lumped together because freedom understood in this very narrow, abstract way, of course, applies to all Americans, all Americans who happen not to be in the jail or in, jail or in the Army. Uh, all Americans who are not in jail and not in the Army are free. In other words, the differences that I was saying were so fundamental to understanding freedom, different groups who are or are not able, practically speaking, to do what they want because the means are or are not available to them, those differences are disguised, are covered over, and people can't see those differences. In effect, what this does, and this is why freedom to a Marxist is part, that is the concept of freedom as it's used and understood in the United States, and I'm including here most libertarian, by most libertarians, is by, by is what Marxists call part of ideology. Ideology means that it serves a particular function, that is understood, freedom understood in this way serves a particular function for our rulers. What is this function? This function is as follows. First, it keeps people who understand freedom in that way from coming to see what group they actually belong to. Working class, for example. What is special about that group? What are the special needs of that group, the special interests of that group? What does that group require as a group 
to do what it wants. To get, that's the question of the working class. To have job security, safer factories, uh, things of this sort, which you don't have to be a socialist worker to, to want. It keeps people from recognizing the distinctiveness of their group and seeing what that group requires to get what it wants. As part of that, it keeps them from grasping who the enemy is. Because when you begin to understand what you need as a member of the group to do what you want, you begin to understand as part of that, who is keeping you from doing that? I mean, if a worker begins to understand that he needs more attention given to job safety, to job security, things of that sort, he begins to see that capitalists are sacrificing all that for maximizing profits. In other words, it makes possible the isolation of the capitalists as the group, which is denying my group the ability to be free. And as part of that, it makes it possible to see who our allies are, because other groups which are treated, for example, farmers, and, and in many cases, small businessmen, and I would include here the students, that these people can also be seen as potential allies because in related ways, they are being hurt by the same ruling group, the capitalists. And to tie all this up, it keeps people that are seeing freedom in this narrow way where you're focusing only on the absence of restraint and, uh, and on the existence of choice without looking at the character of choice. This keeps you from seeing all these things in such a way so that you see what is the, the means for making a change. And that means is a social revolution. By social revolution, I mean a change in the structure of the society which removes the capitalist class from its position of domination in all the structures I mentioned. Not just from its position of domination in the state, but its position from domination in the economy, its position of domination in the culture, that's what a social revolution is. Incidentally, this revolution can be accomplished democratically. It doesn't follow revolution has to be violent. But you understand that, and you understand the possibility for doing that because you notice how many allies you have. When you begin to move away from this definition of freedom, this narrow definition, toward the, the specific the kind of concrete definition which I've suggested. One of the ways Marx once described his theories, he describes his theories once as the theory of the historically specific. What I've suggested is that you can't understand your lives with an abstract definition of freedom, that you must move to a historically specific definition to see who you are, what group you belong to, what that group needs to do what it wants, and why that group isn't doing it, and what changes are required for that to come about. And that understanding, which is, then it's a process, it's not something which occurs as a eureka experience. Developing that understanding is developing an understanding of what it is to be free, and in the process, becoming free. In the process of acting to do some, doing something about it, becoming free. Okay, we're going to have two questions, cross questions. You can start. Uh, when I ask this question, can I set it up with a uh, comment also? Just make it meaningful. Um, I, I think uh, Professor Ullman followed my talk uh, very well in the sense that I had tried to, to set out why it's important, this question of drawing a line, how you distinguish what constitutes uh, the free acts and the, uh, and the prohibited acts or frowned upon acts. Um, and I think that's very close to what he was getting at when he talked about how freedom is an either-or proposition, that you can't talk about freedom for everyone to do everything. Certainly when you define one person's freedom, you're defining to some extent a boundary which limits somebody else's freedom. And so that is the issue as to who is the us and who is the them when you decide that it's between us and them. Well. I think it is that is the important question, but I think to to make the us and them out to be the capitalists versus the workers is first of all not relevant to modern society, and secondly not even in the 19th century a very sharp way of distinguishing the good guys from the bad guys and what we're talking about here. Um, that is to say, I could I could easily find 
hosts of people who, who have to be called uh, members of the working class who are nonetheless promoting oppression by uh, the many workers promote uh, racism, they promote nationalism, promote war. There are many people who are in the working class who work for their living and so on, who it has to be classified in that class category as a member of the working class, but nonetheless aren't uh, what I would call our friends. And the capitalists aren't necessarily our enemies. There are some capitalists who provide, I think, um, needed services and who, who uh, in fact, I think capitalist, most capitalists do provide a definite service in their function in the economy, which is certainly different from Marxists there. But I believe the way capitalists divert investment toward the needs of consumers is a definite function that can't be replaced by a central planning apparatus. Um, but to get to the, to the question, why is it that capitalists and workers is the right way to divide? Why should it be that? Um, I, could, I, I would say it shouldn't be race, racial characteristics that divide us. Shouldn't be national characteristics. Uh, rather, what I would, what libertarians say, ought to be what divides us is a set of principles that defines what kinds of activities each of us is engaging in. And when we find somebody who's a thief, we call him on that basis because he is violating rights. He is therefore against us. And those people who are victims of violations of rights are the ones who are on our side, no matter what their fathers did, no matter what place in the production scheme they fill, no matter what color or nationality they happen to come from. So wh wh why, is, why is it that the either or should be placed in terms of capitalist versus worker? I should start, I suppose, by saying some of the nicest people I know are capitalists. It's true. Uh, and uh, I know a number of people in the working class who I don't like at all, and uh, you net, and you've given some of the reasons for my not liking them. Uh, the division which Marxists make, which for them is central to understanding our society between workers and capitalists, is not based on who we like and don't like as individuals, who we would like to uh, invite into our home and who not. Uh, what is being studied here is not simply individuals, but structures and processes of the way an, an entire society works. Uh, what is most distinctive about our society is that the means of production, factories, machines, uh, offices connected to, to both, that these are privately owned and that the people who own them, some of whom are very nice people, some of whom aren't, but the people who own them uh, use them, put them to work in order to make a profit. And they hire workers to, to work them in order to make a profit. Uh, a shoe manufacturer doesn't, isn't interested in making shoes. He's interested in making a profit. He's interested in making shoes which he can sell and make a profit. And if he can get rid of his shoe business and enter the oil business where the profit's higher, uh, he'll do that at once, if he can. Uh, he's not interested in uh, the jobs which are being provided in that industry. He's not interested in the needs that people have for shoes or oil. He's interested in every case with, can he maximize profit by being in this particular business? Uh, now, that means that he has to conduct himself. They have to conduct themselves in certain ways toward the workers and toward the rest of us. And it's not a matter of their being mean or not. Uh, a nice capitalist can be a capitalist who goes broke and is forced then, I mean, there's an awful lot, there's been more bankruptcies this year than in the last 10 years. And I'm sure some of that was by nice capitalists who didn't know too well the rules of the game that they were playing. Uh, by being nice, that meant that they didn't push their workers so hard. That meant that maybe before the union forced them to, uh, they introduced some safety equipment because things were dangerous. See, capitalists ordinarily, safety equipment costs money. That takes away from the capitalist profit. Uh, having m more light, better air, warmer, uh, uh, heat, better heat in the winter, all of that costs money. And with the 
uh, trade unions in America being weaker than they have been for a very long time, and America only some, now it's about down to about 23 percent of our workforce is unionized, which means about three quarters of our workforce has no means of putting pressure on the capitalist to do these sorts of things. So the capitalist then uh, doesn't do them because they all cost him money, and he's in the business not of making work comfortable uh, and making workers happy, but of making money, and he has the same attitude toward the consumers who he, let me, let me stand up, people in the back, the same attitude toward the consumers, where he's not concerned to pro producing something they can want, he tries to get them to buy it, and that often involves, increasingly involves in our society, talking them into it, and this is what most of advertising is about. Advertising also lets people know where they can get what they want, that's always been the case, but the, what, this is not why the advertising business is a multi-million dollar business. Most of the, the whole growth area in advertising has been the area where people get talked into uh, buying things which they don't uh, yet know they want. So that this is what the capitalist is by virtue of his relationship to the means of production and by virtue of, the, of his function. And this gives him certain objective interests. The workers likewise, their si situation, whether they're nice people or not, whether they're racists or not, whether they're sexists or not, their situation as workers means that they want to have secure jobs, they want to have safe jobs, they want to have jobs which will make them enough money to buy the you know, interior com comforts of life. And in a capitalist society, as you know, there, there's a roller coaster effect to the capitalist economy. We're now going down. The capitalist economy can't provide that. And workers, whether they're nice in, as individuals or not, have to change the structures have to change the structures if they're going to get control of the decision-making process which will enable them to do the things they want, even those minimal things which workers who aren't even socialists want, like having secure jobs, decent cities, uh, good health care, and, and the like. So the division between workers and capitalists, which, and, uh, which, which, which Marx has put at the, at the, at the heart, of, of our society has nothing to do with uh, the, our attitude, Marx's or my attitude, toward the people as individuals, and everything to do about the importance of producing wealth in any society, and what is the specific characteristic, again the word specific, the historically specific characteristic of wealth production in capitalism, and the relationships of the two main groups, uh, the, uh, owners of the means of production and workers, uh, in these means of production, to the means of production, and to each other. And this is what, how you understand well, how a society works, and how you get a hold of the dynamic character of that, of that society. Okay, you can follow the question. <coughs> And again, I, I'm introduce, brief introduction. I said I'd like to try to talk more about the, uh, the state, the role of the state in uh, libertarian thought. Uh, you criticized the state, but you said you didn't have the same view, as I know, toward private property, and that in a society which uh, you favor, you could still have differences of private property and people could still be in business and invest and hire workers and the like. Uh, now, I've suggested that talking about freedom without discussing the means to be free is, is very superficial uh, and misleading. And the means to be free include the power and uh, that comes with, with having uh, means of production and having an unequal amount of wealth. How can uh, you be so sensitive, uh, and I use this in, in, in a good sense, positively sensitive to the way that the state leans, uh, uh, keeps people from being free, so marvelously sensitive to that, and so totally blind to the way inequalities in private property equally keep people, many people, most people in our society, from being free. Okay. 
Okay, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, that the only way that every time any attempt has been made to go beyond the, the private property system that libertarians advocate, that limited amount of freedom, any, any time that attempts have been made to try to transcend that, as, as uh, repeatedly you call it, narrow and so on, that there is more to freedom than that, well, even if I grant that there, there may be some conceivable higher level of freedom than the, the kind that libertarians advocate, uh, nonetheless, it seems to me, studying history, that every attempt that's been made to go beyond this limited program has not even not not only not gone beyond it, but has retreated. That has introduced more power to the state, which takes away even those limited freedoms that we're talking about. So I would say, first of all, that it's not just an either-or thing whether you want the limited freedom of libertarianism or a higher freedom of communism. Rather, it's a question of whether you want the limited freedom of libertarianism or revert to even less freedom than that, even a more crude form than that. And if those are the real alternatives that face us, not, it's not worth it to just quibble about our ideals, whether we'd love to have all of these great uh, virtues of society like equality of all wealth for everybody, everyone having exactly precisely the same opportunities to advance in their, in their lives and so on. All of that, to me, strikes me as just a hope. And they get even less than that. So I would say it's not that I'm insensitive to the fact that some people are poor under capitalism, some people have much less freedom because they have less wealth, freedom in that sense. So, so it's certainly not fair in the sense that I'd love to, I'd love to see everyone have plenty to eat and, and uh, college education at the best schools and so on. That's, that would be great. But I don't believe that there's a way of getting to that. I believe the closest we can get to that is to have a private property system without all the interferences of government, which will then create wealth at the pace that will eventually absolve us from having to face poverty, and that will allow opportunities for those of us who are poor to at least advance beyond the, the minuscule amount of wealth we have at this point. Now, I, I would also point out that it, it's usually the case that this state oppression that libertarians are always attacking hits hardest against the poor people in society. And so it's not as if we're insensitive to the poor people. The, the poor people in the slum areas of New York used to have a number of opportunities to try to make their way, to try to open up their own little uh, vending company or drive a, their own car, which they could pick up for cheap and then put a sign on it that says taxi. All of those opportunities are denied to them now by special privileges that libertarians are poor. And I think it's those sorts of privileges uh, a host of those privileges that I don't have time to go into now, but it's those sorts of status privileges that make the hardships of the poor intolerable and uh, irre 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 uh, impossible to change. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I, so I, it's not as if I I don't feel when I talk to other libertarians that it's that we're insensitive to poverty. Rather, it's that we see a different solution to poverty. Okay, one last question, if I may. Okay, sure. Uh, at the beginning, I said uh, that everyone favors freedom, but the beginning of understanding is to realize that uh, we mean different things and primarily different things based upon belonging to different groups. You have to focus on who you group you belong to, what freedom means for that group. I'd like to say now that a, a similar approach has to be taken to, uh, to history. Everybody learns from history, and we all learn something different. Uh, who, who here is against learning from history? Uh, well, which history? What, what, what piece of history do you pick out and choose to learn from? Uh, my opponent chooses to learn from the example of countries which call themselves socialist and feel that they give us the model of what happens when you try to move toward more freedom by doing away with the kind of private property arrangements which exist in capitalism. I don't think that's the relevant history to learn from. I want to learn from history, but I want to learn from the history of the United States as it exists today. I think that the possible future that we have as Americans comes out of our real past and real present. Again, I want to emphasize what is historically specific. We couldn't become like Russia or China or like the people on the other side of the moon, no matter how we try, no matter how hard we try. The conditions are different. The problems are different. 
uh, so that we could only become uh, what is inherent as a possibility out of what we've been and what we are. Uh, and one of those poss and since we are a, a rich society, a society which has already gone through industrialization, which Russia, China, Cuba did not, a society with a, 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 a widespread, if not very deep going, uh, democratic tradition, which these countries did not have, uh, a society with a high degree of literacy, which did not exist in these societies, what we could do in the way of a socialism, uh, in the way of uh, making an alternative to the private property system of capitalism is and was not possible for these other societies. Uh, the person who first invented the wheel, I'm sure when he came back into the cave and said, look what I got, Charlie, uh, his friend said, look, uh, you know, it'll, it'll never work. No one has ever had that before. And it's true, there was a first time that the wheel, the wheel existed at one point in history for the first time. And so did other, every other innovation, scientific, technological, and social, in terms of social organizations. The future of the United States will bring up a great many more innovations. And it's to look at what we are and can create that you must see what the possibility of an American socialism is, and not into some model drawn from a society which was developed in quite different conditions. So my question, I guess, is uh, why didn't you see this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I must be blinded by the veil presented by capitalist society. And, uh, <laughs> um, that's sort of a hard question to answer, but uh, let's put it this way. I think uh, one of the weaknesses of uh, of Marxism, and I, I am a student of Marxism, and I, ha I have more sympathy with it than most libertarians, I have to admit, but uh, one of the weaknesses that I think I find in almost all Marxist writings is that they seem to refuse to discuss how their alternative system is actually going to work, and whether it's workable. It doesn't seem to me that it's obvious that every conceivable si kind of society um, is potentially workable, and uh, that we should continue to try for it in, in every different country, uh, ignoring every failure because it has different conditions. And then, can, and even if the, every attempt that has occurred in the past has so abysmally failed, that uh, it seems to me that at some point you should be driven to start asking yourself specific questions about how your alternative is actually going to work. It seems like we're usually treated by uh, by the left, uh, at least those parts of the left that still believe in central planning, we're treated to a very vague idea of central planning, of nationalizing all industries, or sometimes now the more popular word is socializing rather than nationalizing. But the, the uh, distinctions between these two terms or uh, any real description of what they're talking about is never brought up in any detail. And... Uh, uh, like in this little response to uh, Chris's article that came out in the Washington Square News, there were some social democrats who used the phrase, but what we want is, uh, we don't want a, a society run by a corporate uh, elite or by a bureaucratic elite. We want a society that is run by society. Now, I submit that that's no statement at all. That doesn't tell us who's going to run, how it's going to work, who has the power, how power relationships are going to be uh, ruled and controlled in that kind of society. And since the libertarians' critique of, of socialism is not that it wouldn't be nice if it were possible, it's that we don't think it's at all possible. We think it's, imp it's, it's a completely utopian goal, um, and we're, we're getting to the point where we doubt that a further attempt is going to do any good for anybody, where in fact we think that it's it's the belief, this continuing belief that government can somehow solve our problems, that government can even run the entire economy, some type of government. Uh, it's a continuing faith in government. That's the very problem that we're facing. So um, I, I think we, we've got to have a better case for why bother with central planning. Why, why try something like this if we have no indication 
that it can work and, and when the advocates don't really bother to try to explain how it could work. And your last question? Um, well, I can just make this all into my last question. I can say, well, what it, how will it work? Um, what, what are the power relationships going to be under socialism? How can we ensure that a, any socialism will not turn into the kind of bureaucratic monster that most attempts at central planning so far, well, I could say every attempt at central planning so far, has regressed into. Um, it seems to be built into the very logic of the idea of centrally planning the economy, that you're going to centralize power relationships. That would seem to indicate that there's going to be an elite which could have control of that centralized power, that in fact elites would be drawn to it. The kind of people who like to rule other people's lives would be drawn to a centralized source of power, particularly if it controls all production in society. And so it seems to me that the end result is going to be e exactly a, a retrogression of society, that we're not going to achieve some equalization that goes beyond libertarian goals, but that, in fact, will re regress to something worse. And the answer, there's three answers. Uh, the first is that no one knows. You're, you're right. No one knows exactly what a socialist America would look like. But no one knew in feudalism what capitalist society would look like. And at different stages in capitalism, no one knew what the next stage was going to look like. We don't know in any detail, but it's wrong to say not knowing in any detail is the same as not knowing at all. Because I think that one has uh, a clearer idea than what you suggested, and I want to indicate what that is. But before I do that, I want to offer a second answer, which is that even if you're right, and I doubt it very much, uh, that socialism in America and in the other advanced capitalist countries would be a centralized kind of socialism with uh, nationalization being the main form of, of socialization. Even if you were right and the kind of bureaucracy you talked about came into existence, most Americans would be more free in such a society than they are today. They would be more free on the, on the basis of the definition that I offered, because I said that there were a whole number of means necessary in order to do what you want. And the, what we talk about as the state deals with only one of those. And a number of these other means, like wealth, like status, are very unequally distributed. And if a centralized socialist society more equally distributed wealth uh, and, st and status, uh, and st if most people who are now in the working class were able to do more of what they wanted in terms of having free time, in terms of going into a variety of jobs and having uh, decent cities, I recall, I mean, certainly Russia is the kind of society which, which you presented, and yet the uh, National Geographic, which is not a communist magazine, I'm sure you know, had a full-page advertisement in the New York Times about six months ago saying the best-run city in the world is Moscow. Uh, there, are certain, there are certain achievements that even a dictatorial centralized society can, can, can arrive at, which will increase the freedom, as I've defined it, of certain groups in the population. Now, I think that even if you're if your nightmare were to come to pass, I would not consider that worse in terms of the freedom of the majority of Americans than what we have now. But I share with you the idea that this is a nightmare and that this is something that we can improve upon. And I see no reason in what socialism is, in what socialists in America want, why socialism would have to be that centralized and, wh and why it would be undemocratic. In, and, and, you, and you asked about the, the distinction between socialization and nationalization. Socialization refers to the fact that we try to do away with means of production which are owned by private individuals whose interest is in maximizing profit, and that we move away from that to some form, and this is why it's social, some form of social ownership where a group of people representing not, not owners uh, but uh, uh, well, I'll indicate who that group can be in a moment. A group of people, through some democratic means, make the decisions on the basis of, of serving public need. There's a distinction here 
between serving private profit, which occurs in capitalist industry, and serving social need, which occurs in, in socialization. Now, there's different forms of socialization, and nationalization is one. That is to say, the post office. The post office is the nationalized mail service. It exists in a capitalist society. Every capitalist society has certain nationalized industries. There's nothing peculiarly socialist about it. I mean, it can exist in a capitalist society and can be run to serve capitalist interests. Uh, that's one form, though, of, of socialization. Of, I mean, they, the mail service isn't run for making a profit, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but other forms, which I think most American socialists favor over the nationalization form, is workers' control, which you apparently had, had some kind words for, consumer, well, that's workers' ownership, where the workers in the factory own it, consumer uh, ownership, consumers' co-ops, there's many of them in many capitalist societies. These could extend in, uh, greatly. Community ownership, uh, municipality ownership of various industries uh, and uh, facilities. Ownership by people in a an apartment house of their apartment house. Uh, you, or, or any mix of, or you could have a, a board elected in the way that we elect people to parliament. You could have people elected to a board and people on that board with, would run an industry, or any mix of these, and I happen to favor the mixes. And I think that what you would find in an American socialism, indeed in socialism in any of the advanced countries, is that the country would experiment with these different forms, that they would experiment with these forms, and they would be looking for two things, for a mix which would serve two ends mainly. One, some degree of economic efficiency, although not that in the absence of every other goal, and the other goal would be creating a situation where the people involved have some sense of being able to meaningfully participate in the decision making of an activity that takes so much of their lives, giving people some control of their lives and a sense of being in control of their lives. And I think that one would experiment with different forms of socialization to where you could try to bring as much as of these two goals into, into reality as possible. And that's what I would see uh, socialism in America moving toward, although I don't, can't give you a blueprint. And most of the socialists, uh, indeed all the socialists that I know, in America, sorry, I take that back, most of the socialists I know uh, would favor you know, moving in this kind of experimental way forward. Very, very few have plans in their back pocket which they want to impose upon anybody. I will devote the next, we was supposed to end at 9.30, but we'll devote the next 20 minutes to uh, questions from the floor. Please be brief. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, having read Rothbard and Remises, Remises and, uh, and, uh, and Chile, even in their most lucid moments, which, which rarely occur in their writings, they very rarely have ever approach the question of the state. Now, exactly what is the state? Now, the state is a symbolic legal crystallization of the division of class society. Now, Marx addressed this question, and Engels addressed this question anti-during. Lenin addressed the state, and we addressed this question to the state and revolution, as well as in imperialism and the high state of capitalism. Now, if you realize that, that the state Especially if you look in 1970 with the Soviets, which were only which were only provisional state apparatuses of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was which was supposed to be transitional phases, it's understandable that 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 they were supposed to wither away. Now 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 well, now, now it's understandable that a state apparatus is a, is a, is a basic repressive apparatus, and and under a communist society or social society. There would, there would be no need to have necessarily a centralized state. Okay, a state is, is basically for a provisional means, a transitional means. It's mainly to basically secure the gains and the successes that have been won. You mentioned before, as an aside, of, of, of about how the Soviet Union had a type of czarist element to it. I was in the Soviet Union a few years ago. I didn't see, on the one hand, Guild craftsmen and journeymen, uh, patricians, and Chaldean serfs and slave masters, unfortunately. When I looked around for them, I didn't find them there. Uh, I think the latter, I would say, that does exist there, um, maybe in slightly I different guise. The Soviet Union is a form of state capitalism. 
I'm not saying it's a socialist country, it's authoritarian, it has its inadequacies just like capitalism does. But I think it's important to understand that the reason why you have a state is because you have class divisions. And the class divisions manifest themselves as a state appearing above class divisions as a regulator of class antagonisms to keep them in check. If you have the abolition of class divisions, by which can only come about by expropriating the expropriators, by expropriating those people who have in turn expropriated the wealth of those who created it. And by that, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm simply trying to say is thus. What I'm trying to say to you is that wealth is socially created. Wealth, wealth is socially created. The, fact, the factory assembly line at GM Ford Motor Company, at, at any, any company you take, take a factory in Midtown, you have, you have the socialization and the centralization of labor, which is socialized but you have privatized ownership. In other words, labor and wealth is socially produced, but its ownership is individually owned. That imposes a class contradiction. And that class con contradiction is not only, not only what gives rise to, to class divisions, but class divisions are maintained and, 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 and suspended by this type of division of labor. What I'm saying is that, is that, is that, a, that a type of Ayn Randian formula, a type of uh, John Gold's speech on the right of man, is not going to solve your solutions. I mean, Ayn Rand offers no program. Rothbard has no program, coherent program, that is. Uh, I, think that I think that basically what you have to look at is that how, how the state came about, what are its origins, and if you read Angles in the Private Property and the Family, you will, you will understand the origins of the state and of the family okay. and how they come about. Good show. Can, can I uh, ask? That? I hope so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, first, there's obviously great differences between the libertarian concept of class and the Marxian concept of class. Um, the libertarian concept of class does not simply say that the government arises because there are classes and that the classes emerge because of differences in the uh, ap approach to the labor uh, relation, you know, whether they're workers or capitalists, their approach to the means of production, or their attitude with respect to the means of production. That's not what the, when the libertarians talk about class, we say that the government is not just a result of a class that's caused by this other thing, but that the government is itself the cause of all class uh, conflict. Government, in fact, class conflict is defined by libertarians as governmental type relationships between people. That saying, is coercive relationships between people. But the, but the thing is, we're not talking about the same classes, so that it may confuse you if you think along those terms. What what libertarians mean by class. And if you have, in fact, read Rothbard, what he means by class is that uh, is that relationship that's caused by the state directly. And so he believes that the way to get states to wither away is not to have a socialist revolution and have a government take over all the means of production and hope that something happens to make the state wither away. Rather, it's directly to make the state wither away, to push it back, to refuse to pay taxes, to, to refuse to serve in the military and to take every step to resist the state. That's the way we believe to make the state wither away. I fully agree with you, but I, but I, but I, but I okay, would well, like to raise one point. I'm sorry, we have to okay, take questions from other very, people. Very short. In 1940 and 41, three seconds. In China, it, was called, it was called the rectification program. The rectification program, Mao Zedong realized that what was happening was that there was a bureaucratic task being formed. And that bureaucratic caste was being formed. So what he initiated was a rectification program which the masses were brought into the actual planning of the, of the administration of factory councils, workers' councils. In the okay, we just have another question. Thank you. I'd like to ask Professor Goldman, what uh, relationships exist that make one person's need or want they claim money for another person? Why look at the capitalist and what the capitalist has if even if they create the wealth on their own and the workers agree to help them create that wealth? Isn't that pure envy, looking at what another person has and simply grabbing it because they have it? And isn't that a step back to the baboon age that um, 
I don't know why he spoke of before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that it is, it's going to go down. If it is as you describe it, then it's empty. Uh, if it's, let's leave open the possibility that it's something else. I don't think that uh, when you graduate, when maybe I, I shouldn't speak about you, when most people graduate, they have a choice about whether to go to work or not. Uh, and I don't think that uh, they can choose out of their heads the kind of ideal job they would like to work at and the ideal set conditions and salary they would like to get. They have to choose between what's available. Uh, life is a matter, you go through a series of, of labyrinths, and at each, at a certain number of uh, places, you have to choose from the available alternatives. I sometimes get the impression that libertarians are a little bit like people who go into a Chinese restaurant and order pizza. Uh, that, that they they just don't give enough attention to what are the objective situation in which you happen to be and what the limits of that situation is. In a Chinese restaurant, you know, you do have some choices, but pizza isn't one of them. And so it is for everybody as we go through life. Now, the Marxist is concerned with examining those objective alternatives between which we must choose. And for some people, well, these alternatives vary from from class to class. The alternatives for someone born of a millionaire who goes to Harvard and has daddy's business ready for him when he gets out, he has one set of alternatives to choose between. Uh, someone whose father's a factory worker and uh, you know, has to go to work to support the family at 17, 18, he has other alternatives. In each case, the person has choices. I wouldn't say that the, the second person has no choices at all, but they're very limited and rooted to his objective situation. So Marxism is concerned with the fact that most workers have objective alternatives which are very, very limited, and therefore we can't choose. We can't choose those things which would realize our potential as human beings, which would even, well, that's going too far. Certainly we can't do that. But which would even achieve job security, which would even give us uh, decent health care and safe cities. We can't even choose those things. Now, to get those things, to get those things in a society like ours, we have to take away, and this isn't envy, have to take away the means which are now in the power of the capitalists. And that will permit us as a group to get what we want. So it's a question of which side are you on, comrade? If you happen to be, you know, the son of a millionaire, then you're perfectly rational. You're perfectly rational in wanting capitalism to continue because these are the conditions which permit you to be free. But if you're not the son of a millionaire and you want these conditions to continue, then something's wrong with the way you think. I have a uh, brief follow-up to that. Very brief. When you were talking about the workers having these certain conditions, and then before when you were talking about the capitalists, you were saying that the capitalists pretty much could dictate the terms of the game through advertising. Do um, you think that's really the case when you have Edsel feel, uh, the case of the Edsel, which lost four hundred million dollars, where um, nobody could dictate the terms of the world. There's no security for anyone in the world. So why do you assume that for the worker there is no security, but for the capitalist there is such security? It's the security is relative. Uh, it's not absolute for the capitalist, and it's not totally non-existent for most workers. Uh, it's relative, but the capitalist has much greater security, and with his wealth, and with his position, and with his status, he can manipulate not only his environment, but the environment of the workers. We go to, we live in neighborhoods, we go into, to buy into stores, and the, the choices that we have to make in our daily lives are mostly laid down, through from the very, from our birth, are mostly laid down by what capitalists have created in the process of making wealth. And those have created the circumstances in which we grew up, get socialized. So maybe we don't buy an Edsel, but we buy another Detroit car until very recently. But then it's a, but now Detroit is building their, these cars that come from Europe are still, you know, American capitalists, uh, international capitalists producing them. So it's, it's still they controlling what it is that we want. 
to a very large extent, not all of us and not completely. make the power and an and ideology such as individual rights, which allegedly our constitution guarantees. <laughs> or you have or you have the majority say what freedom is and the majority be the power. And um, I guess the reason I be, I chose to be a libertarian as opposed to a Marxist is because I was afraid that just because the majority um, is in power, I don't think it always is going to guarantee freedom. And also because um, in my readings, it seems that communes and the like could spring up. A s socialism could exist within libertarianism, but not vice versa. Um, could you address that? Well, first of all, let, let, me again, let me again stress that I don't think it's possible to think in terms of freedom in the abstract. Freedom for who to do what, in what conditions, and who's going to suffer the consequences. You've got to answer those questions or you're, you're not saying anything concrete. And also the majority. Majorities don't exist in the abstract. Are you a part of that majority? If you're a part of that majority and can have any input, then that's fine that that majority makes decisions. The people in the minority, the capitalists, they're going to have to suffer some consequences. Now, I, I don't say that me thinking in terms of guillotines or even prison. I mean, I really don't. The consequences, and they'll cry plenty when it happens, is that their power over the means of production will be taken away. They'll have to go to work like the rest of us, and they'll cry because of that. But they will that will be taking away their freedom. So I don't mind the majority ruling if I'm in the majority. And I think the, and the majority that I'm talking about is not the majority of you know bearded college professors at NYU. I'm talking about the majority of people who work for a living. I mean, I understand it in a very broadest sense. And a lot of compromises will be made, and lots of areas will be left for people to make you know, their choices as, as unique individuals. What to what to wear, who to marry, what kind of house to live in. I don't see why uh, you know, the majority is going to exercise any uh, power over that. They will probably create the opportunities in which these choices could be made more easily, with less suffering, uh, than, they're, than they're made now. So you have, to, you have to begin by deciding what side you're on. You can't think simply, obviously you're Joe Smith, a unique individual. Uh, but that's so obvious not to need too much, you know, too much attention. The really important step is to decide what side you're on in terms of the clashes between uh, groups and classes in our society and see what that class needs in order to have the power to permit the members of that class, of which you are one, to do what they want, to be free. And that is the beginning of politics. Sure to head. Well, the first absolutely indispensable step is for most of the workers to understand that they're workers, to understand what their class is, and to understand what they need to be free. Now, when that happens, then I think that a variety of means are possible in order to take over the power. I would have thought that one of them in a society with a long democratic tradition is the democratic process. I'm not saying that I'm sure this is the way it's going to happen, but even Marx indicated in his day that one that uh, the democratic process might be used for a revolution. See, revolution is, is, is has to do with the turnover, the changeover in who has power economically and political. It doesn't deal with a particular form. There's various forms. There, there is such a thing as a democratic revolution. Now, Marx indicated you might have democratic revolutions in Holland, England, and the United States because of the democratic process meaning something. Now, as we saw in Chile, uh, it doesn't mean everything. 
uh, and you know the rules of the game can be changed by the by the other side once they start losing by their own rules of the game and i recognize that as a possibility for the united states that is to say that the capitalists might attempt a coup at the time when it seems as if a socialist party is about to achieve power democratically but that's something which is possible and i would have thought that's something i i personally would work for that also what happened in france in 68 gives you some idea of how social change might occur in an advanced capitalist society we had a general strike the fact that the students triggered it off is incidental it could be triggered off in various ways but there was a general strike and in the process of that strike an alternative governmental structure was being formed that is to say these uh, factories and cities which were on strike for a period of two three four weeks they began to set up committees to deal with elementary chore housekeeping chores like uh, keeping electricity on uh, the uh, buses running and, and things of this sort, providing doctors and food. And these committees were really becoming governmental committees. They were doing the work that a government does. And then these committees began to link up in France, and you had the uh, new uh, 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 system which would have emerged at a certain point as an alternative government. It didn't go quite that far, but that gives you some idea uh, of what could happen in a general strike situation. I personally don't, can't conceive of uh, socialist change coming in an advanced capitalist society, given the kind of power of the, of the capitalist class and the kind of weaponry involved. I can't conceive of it happening through people running in the streets with, with, with guns, you know, a la the storming of the Winter Palace in the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, at that time, that was a possibility. It isn't for an advanced society. And I, I, I hope it doesn't occur through a military coup, such as almost took place in Portugal, because military coups, 90, 999 are to the right, and then one like in Portugal comes along, or almost came along, which was somewhat to the left. Uh, given the odds, I, you know, I hope that, it, that that isn't the way that social change has to come. So I would prefer one of the first two kinds, and I would work for the first one. I don't think you can work for a general strike. Okay, two brief questions. Brief questions. Oh, sorry. But so the, the key thing, the key thing again, is to work for increasing the number of people who are workers, broadly understood, to understand who they are, and to begin to, well, you know, to think of ways to make the change. The actual mechanisms. Too much time is spent on the mechanisms, because a small number of people talking about mechanisms sounds as if they're nuts. I think. Uh, how do how do we get together and achieve state? We leave the Loeb Student Center. We take over the state. Park. I mean, you know, some left wing groups talk like that. Unfortunately, uh, I think that the answer always has to be on uh, on getting more people to understand uh, what side they're on and what that means. That was worth waiting for. Okay. One and two. Okay, uh, I just want to respond to what I consider Marx's point to what you said. Holland and England and the U.S. have changed quite a bit in the last hundred and forty whatever years it's been since Marx made those statements. Um, in point of fact, in this country, in the last ten years, we've seen that the U.S. government couldn't even allow Daniel Ellsberg his rights, um, couldn't even allow the Black Panthers their rights, um, or the Chicago Seven. It's clear that even when faced with very minor threats to their rule. There's our support. And, and in a way, this re relates to the libertarian point of view that um, I would say that if the state was done away with two weeks later, would be back. That powerful interests require powerful states. Um, and to finish up with the violent revolution, uh, I think France in 68 and Iran, Iran is a very bad, a very bad example that shows that powerful army uh, is only as powerful as the soldiers who hold the gun. That if the soldiers decide that no longer are they going to fire the guns um, in the direction the officers tell them, all the weaponry in the world, in fact, the more weaponry he has in that situation, the worse it is for shooting the wrong way as far as, as the capital is concerned. Can you ask a question, please? Wait. Um, I'm not sure if I do, but I might want to respond. Um, the point is that um, this France of 68 is another example. But that's no reason why you cannot have. Um, non-electoral solution to the question of the problem happening. Well, yes, America, Holland, and um, 
England have changed in the hundred years since Marx said those words, but they have not changed in, in ways which would make them less relevant, but in ways which would make them more relevant, because none of these three currencies have wavered uh, from their use of the democratic process. Uh, and this democratic process has extended in all these countries into the development of trade unions and to other areas of life where people get together, have discussions, and make decisions on the basis of majority rule. And I do think that the situation does exist in uh, these countries for the democratic process to be tried. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure it's going to work, but I think that the, there is a good chance that, that it work, and this is what should be tried. I don't know uh, all the possible scenarios uh, which could bring socialism to power. But again, I would stress that isn't really where the emphasis should be. Uh, the emphasis should be on creating a large majority who want socialism in some sense. And when that occurs, I think maybe more than one possible scenario will open up. Okay, uh, given that we accept your ideal society, isn't it really counterproductive to use the state as a vehicle to achieve it, since the, the people who would be forcing us to share would probably take a larger share for themselves? I have a feeling when libertarians talk about the state that it's a little bit like blaming the messenger for the black, bad message. Uh, the message is coming from somewhere, from someone else. Uh, every state is an instrument in the hands of certain groups and the, it's the groups who hold power and have the privileges and wealth which that society can offer to a certain certain small number and they use the state in two ways ma mainly to secure the relationships in which they are on top and also in a positive way to get done the things which are most efficiently done when they come together and, and organize their power in that way because after all they have disputes too in capitalism the capitalist class is divided in many different ways and they're constantly fighting with each other and there needs to be some uh, set of institutions through which they can act collectively to achieve the interests of the whole class so any group needs the state for these two, pur two purposes protect their position in power and to do most effectively which they as in all of them despite their differences want to get done the same will be true of the workers the same will be true of us as workers it, when we come to power we'll certainly need the state in some form to protect us against a return of the old order as we saw in chile we get some idea of what that meant uh, I mean, it's not true that people who lose are going to immediately, you know, forgive and forget. I mean, the Shah is, you know, planning like hell on how to get back. I'm sure. Uh, so you need the you need the state to preserve the new power relationships which have come into being, and also a socialist society is trying to go somewhere uh, in terms of the production of wealth, in terms of the creation of more livable cities. In, in terms of American socialist society, in terms of raising the living standards of the whole world. And one would want to organize that effort to go in that direction in a relatively efficient way, and the state would be a means to do so. Now, there is the danger. There is the danger uh, in any group that whoever gets to be president uh, has a little bit more power, will enjoy that position and, and try to perpetuate himself. But if we're talking about a situation where where the majority of the people have played a part in bringing a socialist government to power. I don't think a socialist government could come to power in any other condition. It couldn't be brought to power by a coup of a small group or a small vanguard. Therefore, the majority of the people having played a role in bringing the socialist government to power, I don't think they're going to let it get away with taking power away from them and having power over them. They're going to be, pay very close attention to what, what the socialist government does. Marx, one of the relatively few comments he makes about government in the future socialist society, uh, compliments the organization of the Paris Commune and the ultra-democratic way in which they tried to control those people in power. The people elected uh, in the Commune plan were not going to be representatives in, in the American sense, people who you elect because you like their teeth or even you like their good judgment, but rather were, were to be mandated and sent to vote certain ways on certain key questions. Uh, and if they didn't vote that way, it was very easy to recall them. There was the instrument of the recall, and they would 
despite the fact that elections were very frequent, something like every two years, uh, so that you had people with a much tighter control uh, on their governmental leaders. Marx also advocates, following again the example of the Paris Commune, that people elected to government should not make higher salary than the workers. So that, you know, there isn't that economic incentive to want to, 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 get, to get elected. So there are various ways that uh, a socialist society, a socialist society, could exercise meaningful control upon the people who are elected uh, to, uh, to, you could even, uh, again in a commune, you couldn't be elected more than a few times in a row. You couldn't make a, prof a lifetime profession out of being uh, a, a government, uh, a parliamentarian or a bureaucrat. This, these are things which I think could be worked in, and judging the sensitivity of most American socialists, indeed most socialists in the Western world, to this criticism of socialism as bureaucracy, because the kind of criticism you're making is made ten times more by socialists of, you know, of, of this as a possibility. Judge, given this sensitivity, I think a lot of these, uh, these techniques would be used to ensure that socialism would be ultra-democratic. I'd just like to bring comment on the same question. That uh, it, it seems like the, even in the Paris Commune case, which is perhaps one of the model cases of a state, um, even there, there's like every two years that you can mandate a voter uh, a, a vote on a specific issue, and so clearly the amount of specific control that the person has over the, what the government is doing is not the, the kind of direct control that you might ideally like. And in fact, I think it's because it's necessarily the case. The state has a whole set of functions it has to perform on a day-to-day -day basis, assuming that you want a state at all. And I think what's being missed is that this, any state, any government, has an internal dynamic to it. It's not as if you can devise a whole set of rules that makes your state just like a Pollyanna that makes your state do all the good things, unlike all the bad states of the past. In fact, states are what they are. They have internal, necessary relationships. And what states tend to do is, first of all, they tend to hire all the people who like to run other people's lives. Those are the people who love to run states, who love to get jobs there. They, and, and the internal dynamics of the decisions that are made within the state tend to be decisions that revert power to that same body. So it's not as if you can continually recall them every time they make the wrong decision because everything they're going to be trying to do as a state is going to be trying to gel their own power as opposed to the people that they're ruling over. I think what we have to look for is not a way of devising a perfect form of this ancient institution called the state. Rather, we have to find a way to get beyond it altogether and do something different. Well, I'm, I'm not against moving toward getting beyond it. But again, you talk about state the way uh, people here have, and most liberals do, about freedom. Again, in the abstract. I don't think, and, and, and for evidence, you, you move to pop psychology. You know, this is how people I've met in my life act. I don't think that's the way to understand the state, the specific states which have existed in human history. There has not been a state run by the working class. There has not been the Paris Commune was as close as you came to that. And so you, you haven't got the kind of example uh, of what I'm talking about. And that is not a reason to reject it, because, again, the future is going to be the full of things which have not existed uh, until that point. Uh, you have to look at who would run that state, what their interests would be, and what would be the best way of organizing that state to serve their interests. But finally, I just want to leave you with this, that you're dealing in, in politics as in other areas of your life with real alternatives between which you make, must make choices. To be against a worker state is, is, is to choose what, in fact? It's to choose a situation, which is the present, where the people who have more wealth are making those decisions. People who you don't know, who don't care about you, you have no influence on them, you have no democratic control over their decision making, they're making those decisions now. And I'm suggesting that that is not only undemocratic, but that doesn't permit you to be free. And that if you had a state where you could have some democratic participation, that this would increase your freedom. And this is what we've been talking about. What do you need to do to increase your freedom? It is obvious that this is going to be the first in a series of dialogues between the left and libertarians. I'd like to thank Don Lavoy and Professor Ullman.